All right, Luke chapter 1. Let's talk about say yes to God. We're going to start reading in verse 26, the Christmas story. Luke 1, beginning in verse 26. The Bible says in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth are a couple that Luke introduces at the very beginning of Luke chapter 1. I'm going to talk about them. She was a, a barren, older woman, couldn't have children, and God visited them. And so in the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Rejoice, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to his son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled, just as you've said. Then the angel left her. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit. To minister to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us and for your powerful word. Father, I pray that we would encounter you personally as we receive your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. If I could have just one wish for you this Christmas, it would be that you would say yes to God. I wish that you would follow Mary's example and say yes to God completely. Say yes to God in faith, trusting that his way is best. Say yes to God, trusting that he is more than able to do just what he has said. Say yes to God without hesitation. Say yes to God without reservation. Say yes to God without any negotiations. Say yes to God without qualification, without objections. This Christmas season, just say yes to God. Right now, we're looking at stories of faith together. We're looking at some of the heroes of faith in the Bible and considering the defining moments of faith in their lives. What can we learn from them? What encouragement can we draw from them? You see, the Bible says that all of their stories were written for our benefit. They're written down for our learning, for our caution, for our encouragement. As a congregation, we've come to our own defining moment of faith. We're just two weeks away, can you believe it, from holding our first preview service in our new sanctuary. Sanctuary won't be 100% complete yet. We're working. We've had uh, extra crews here working every day, six days a week. Uh, we won't be all put together, but it'll be finished enough that we can meet inside on Christmas Eve. But right now we have an urgent need for funds to finish the building. We need about $250,000 in cash to finish the sanctuary level, need a little bit more to finish the lower level, but our goal right now is to finish the sanctuary, get a temporary certificate of occupancy, and start using it, and then we'll keep on working on the lower level. So we're asking you all to stand with us in faith right now. When we need faith, the place to turn is the Bible. Faith comes from 
hearing and hearing from the Word of God. Looking at Gabriel's visit to Mary, I see three ways that we should say yes to God this Christmas season. And I want to talk about it with you quickly this morning. Three ways to say yes to God this Christmas season. First of all, say yes to God's word. Say yes to God's word. At the most unexpected time, God sent his word to the most unexpected person in the most unexpected place. God dispatched Gabriel to bring a message to a peasant girl named Mary living in a one-horse town called Nazareth. Now, Luke 1 tells us that six months earlier, Gabriel visited a priest named Zechariah while Zechariah was offering incense in the holy place in the temple. Now, that made sense. An angel appearing to a Jewish priest in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, but it is really hard to overstate the insignificance of this young girl named Mary. It's very likely that Mary was just 12 years old when Gabriel found her. Under Roman law, the minimum age for marriage was 12 for a girl, 14 for a boy. Augustus Caesar, who was the Caesar at the time, established the age of 10 as the minimum age for betrothal. Betrothal was kind of like our engagement, only on steroids. When a couple was betrothed, they were already considered married, although they haven't come together and consummated the marriage. Betrothal could only be broken by divorce or by death. The Jews had customs of their own, and the typical age for marriage for a girl was 12 and a half. See, girls were considered an economic liability liability to their fathers, but an asset to their husbands. A young wife had lots of years of hard work in her. Girls were also considered a risk to their fathers. Should they lose their virginity before marriage, they would then be unmarriageable and they would become a lifelong burden to the family. For those reasons, girls were usually married off by 13 years old. Although the Bible doesn't say, Joseph was probably in his 20s. Mary was most certainly illiterate. She was from a family with absolutely no social standing. Luke doesn't even bother to mention them. She was from an insignificant town with a bad reputation. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Do you know that it wasn't until 1962 that archaeologists found any evidence for the existence of Nazareth outside of the New Testament and Christian writings. It took them 2,000 years of digging to find even a mention of Nazareth. Jesus literally put that town on the map. It's highly unlikely that Mary had ever traveled more than a few miles from her hometown or that she ever would. Like billions of other young girls, Mary was destined to a life of scarcity and hard work and inconsequence. And then she was destined to die anonymously without making any kind of mark in the world. Until a single word from heaven changed everything. Rejoice, highly favored one. The distinguished Catholic theologian Raymond Brown has written that Hail Mary, full of grace, is a terrible translation of Luke's words in Luke chapter 1. He writes that it has led to the conclusion that there was something resident inside of Mary already that brought Gabriel to her, but that is not at all Luke's point. Luke's point is that to this young, simple peasant girl who had absolutely nothing of earthly significance to her credit, God sent his word of divine favor and that word changed everything. And here's what Luke especially wants us to see. Mary's reception 
of the word. Look at how Mary reflected on the word. You know, the angel Gabriel appears three times in scripture. The first time he appeared to Daniel in Babylon. Daniel was an old man. He was a biblical scholar. He was a prophet from his teen years. He had been an intercessor. He had been used by God in supernatural ways. He had witnessed firsthand miracles. But when Daniel saw Gabriel, he was scared speechless. The second time Gabriel appeared, it was to elderly Zechariah in the temple. As a priest, Zechariah was also a biblical scholar. He spent his entire life studying the Old Testament scriptures, the encounters between God and men and angels and men. He spent his entire career working side by side with priests who went in and out of the holy place and even the holy of holies. But when Zechariah saw Gabriel, he was scared speechless. The third time Gabriel appeared, it was to a 12-year-old peasant girl named Mary. The only scriptures she knew were the ones that she had been taught to recite. She had never studied the rabbinic commentaries on the angelic visitations of the Old Testament. She barely had any life experiences, let alone spiritual experiences. And yet little Mary seems completely unfazed by Gabriel's presence. Instead, she is fascinated by his words. Mary was greatly troubled, not at the sight of him. Mary was greatly troubled, not at his glowing appearance. Mary was greatly troubled, not by this intrusion. She was greatly troubled at his words. And she pondered what his greeting meant. Mary wasn't bothered by the messenger. She desperately wanted to understand God's message. Verse 29 says she pondered the meaning of Gabriel's greeting. It's in a continuous sense. She kept on pondering the meaning. She kept on reflecting on the implications of God's word to her. She kept on reflecting on what was being promised to her and also what was being asked of her. She kept thinking about the cost and the consequences, the risks and the rewards. She contemplated both the grace that was being extended to her and also the gravity of becoming one of God's instruments. Look at how Mary reflected on the word and look at how she responded to the word. Mary carefully contemplated God's word and then she said yes to the whole thing. Her reply to God was, let it all happen to me according to your word. Everything your word promises, everything your word encompasses, everything it implies, everything it requires of me, everything it obligates me to do, everything your word brings to me, whether it be suffering or blessing or a bit of both, God, I say yes to all of it. I agree. I give my consent. I submit to it. I entrust myself to your word. Bring it on. Let it be unto me according to your word. At the very beginning of the gospel, Luke is playing with us. He's Comparing old, experienced old Zachariah with inexperienced little Mary. And he's sending an implicit message to us. Don't be like Zechariah. Be like Mary. Mary is a model disciple of Jesus. She reflected on God's word and she responded with a resounding yes. And that's what God wants all of us to do. If I could have one wish for you this Christmas, it would be that God would come and interrupt your ordinary, quiet, orderly life by sending his word of divine favor to you and that you would respond with a resounding yes. Say yes to his word. 
Say yes to all that his word promises you. Say yes to all that his word prescribes to you. All that it prohibits from you. Say yes to all the blessings of the word. Say yes to all the instructions of his word. Say yes to all the conditions of his word. Say yes to accountability to the word. You see, once you've heard the word, you're accountable for what you've heard. Say yes to the affirmations and the confrontations of his word. You see, Gabriel's message from God contained both affirmation and confrontation. He spoke favor, 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 grace, grace, grace over a poor peasant girl. He affirmed her worth in God's eyes. He affirmed her significance to God. He affirmed that her life had meaning and purpose and yet he also addressed mankind's need for salvation. He addressed our sin condition and our need for a savior. You will call him Jesus. That means God saves. For he shall save his people from their sins. You know, that need for salvation, it extended even to Mary. In her song, the Magnificat, Mary said, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Say yes to both the affirmation and the confrontation of God's words. You are infinitely valuable to God. Your life has meaning and purpose and significance, but you also have a spiritual need that's common to everyone, even to Mary. Say yes to the authority of his word. Say yes to the risks and the rewards of his word. Say yes to the cost on earth of obeying his word. Say yes to whatever his word brings you. As you ponder the meaning of the Christmas story, my prayer is that your heart will say like Mary, let it all happen to me according to your word. Three ways to say yes to God this Christmas season. Say yes to God's word. Second, say yes to God's unusual ways. Say yes to God's unusual ways. In the Christmas story, we have yet another reminder that God works in mysterious ways. In Isaiah, God says, As the heavens are high above the earth, so my ways are are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God is unusual in the people he chooses to use. Don't believe me? Just look around. Or just look forward. Get the same effect. In the Christmas story, God chose a faithful old priest who together with his wife had endured the pain of barrenness their entire married life. To the Jewish people, barrenness was seen as a sign of God's disapproval. It made Zechariah and Elizabeth suspect what sin had they committed, what was wrong in their family that they had earned such disfavor from God. Standing in front of the altar of incense for the one and only time in his life, Zechariah whispered one last prayer for a child, please God. And God chose a faithful young peasant girl with few prospects. You see, these are the kind of people that God loves to call upon. He loves to call on people with immovable mountains in their lives. People with problems. People in pain. People caught in the rhythm of ordinary life who have resigned themselves to the status quo. God loves to turn zeros into heroes. When the Corinthians were getting a little too big for their britches, Paul wrote to them and said, what were you before God called you? Not many of you were wealthy. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were gifted. No, God chose the foolish, weak, lowly, and despised things of the world. How's that for affirming language? Beloved, listen, never get too big for your britches. If you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, it will result in exaltation. But if God has to humble you, it will result in humiliation. 
God is unusual in the people he chooses to use. And he's unusual in the ways that he works. Gabriel announces to Mary that she's going to conceive and give birth to a son called Jesus. But there is one insurmountable obstacle. Mary is a virgin. Three times Luke reiterates that she's a virgin. She has never been with a man. What happens next is amazing. Mary asks a question that's almost identical to the question that Zechariah asked Gabriel in the temple. But how can this be? Zechariah's question drew indignation and a swift rebuke from Gabriel and the punishment of temporary silence. But Mary's almost identical question drew a gracious explanation and a favorable, joyful sign of Elizabeth's pregnancy. But what was the difference between Zechariah and Mary? The difference was the faith in their heart. Zechariah, the priest, asked a question of disbelief. He was perfectly positioned of all people to believe, yet he didn't believe. The angel said, you'll be silent because you didn't believe. Mary, the Jewish peasant girl, asked a question of belief. She knew practically nothing about anything, and yet she believed. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth affirms her and says, Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise. Beloved, can I tell you this morning, it's possible for two people to perform practically the identical acts of worship and yet have two very different outcomes. One receives a blessing and the other silence. Two people can sing the same worship song and one gets filled up to overflowing with the joy of the Lord and the other remains empty. Two people can give offerings and one gets blessed and the other continues to struggle. Two people can read the word and pray and one gets strengthened and encouraged and the other remains anxious and depressed. Two people can fast and one sees breakthrough and the other doesn't. What's the difference? It's what's in the heart. Cain and Abel both brought offerings consistent with their vocations. But God accepted Abel's offering and he rejected Cain's. Why? Because of what was in the heart. Don't be a Zechariah. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were faithful to their office. They had, Luke says, they had meticulously followed all of God's commandments and decrees. They were dutiful, but they weren't fruitful. Somewhere along the way, Zechariah had lost the joyfulness of childlike trust in God. Somewhere along the way, in all of his learning and in all of his studying, he had lost the simplicity of faith. Don't be like that. Don't be like Zechariah. Don't come to church week after week after week and be perfectly positioned to believe, yet fail to believe. Don't serve God from a duty paradigm. Live in a faith paradigm. In his disbelief, Zechariah was incredulous. How can this be? But in her faith, Mary was curious. How will this be? Gabriel explains to Mary the details of the virgin birth. The Holy Spirit will come upon you The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Ancient religions and ancient mythologies and legends are rife with lewd tales of divine beings coming and having relations with human beings. I want you to know that they have absolutely nothing to do with the Christian doctrine of the virgin birth of Christ. God did not come in a human-like form and have relations with Mary. Instead, by some holy operation that is beyond our comprehension, God's power moved inside of Mary's body and enabled her to conceive. 
we are not able to say what happened biologically, only that the result was a child unlike any other child who has ever been born. A child whose father was not a man, but God himself, and whose mother was a woman named Mary. A child who was holy, the son of God. A child who was fully human, and yet in whose body all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt. We're not able to say what happened inside of Mary's body, but divinity mingled with humanity, and Mary conceived and gave birth to the one and only God-man, Jesus Christ. When Mary said, let it all happen to me according to your word, I want you to catch this. She was saying yes to something that has never been seen in the world either before or since. She said yes to something that defies everything we know about biology and human reproduction. She said yes to something that defied thousands of years of human experience. She said yes to something that outwardly defied everything her Jewish people held dear related to morality and ethics. She said yes to something that deeply offended the Jewish sense of propriety. It appeared unseemly. It appeared scandalous. She said yes to something that people wouldn't believe. She said yes to something that not only put her engagement to Joseph at risk, but put her life and his at risk. Joseph would be the number one suspect for a premature pregnancy. Beloved, if I could wish anything for you this Christmas, it would be that you would say yes to God's unusual ways of working in your life and working in his world. God often works in ways that are very messy from a human standpoint. He doesn't do things in conventional ways as we regard them. He's unpredictable from our perspective. His timing is not our timing. God's ways of working often offend our sense of earthly prudence. His ways can offend our ideals of preparedness. They can offend our ideals of fiscal management and responsibility. Jesus praised a widow who out of her need gave everything she had. God's ways can offend our sense of moral propriety. In the bloodline of Jesus, there's Tamar who dressed up like a prostitute in order to trick her own father-in-law into having relations with her. There's Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho. There's Ruth, a two-time widow from Moab. The Jews were forbidden to ever intermarry with the Moabites, but she's in the bloodline of Jesus. There's Bathsheba, who committed adultery with David. And then there's Mary, who became inexplicably pregnant during her engagement. Imagine that. Imagine God using people with shady pasts. Imagine God using people who don't look the way we think they ought to look. Who don't act perhaps the way we think they ought to act. Sometimes God's unusual ways of working, they defy our sensibilities. They offend us. God works in ways that defy the laws of nature as we comprehend them. They defy the rules of economics. They defy good business sense. They defy military strategy. They defy science. They defy mathematics, statistics, odds, and algorithms. What are the odds that a little peasant girl from Nazareth would become the most celebrated woman in the history of mankind? What are the odds that one man would fulfill all the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. Do you know there was a mathematics professor from MIT who had his students crunch some numbers and they calculated the possibility of one man fulfilling just eight, just eight of the messianic prophecies. What was the possibility one man would fulfill just eight? The students came back with a number that the odds were one in ten to the seventeenth power. 
Now, to help you wrap your brain around that a little bit, if they were silver dollars, that would be enough silver dollars to cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. And the odds of one of them being red and a blindfold man reaching in and on the first try picking out the right silver dollar, that's the odds that one man would fulfill eight, just eight of the messianic prophecies Jesus fulfilled over 350. God works in unusual ways. God's ways are humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. God's ways are give and it shall be given back to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God's ways are seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else you need will be added unto you. God's ways are love your enemy, turn the other cheek, pray for those who mistreat you, give to everyone who asks you, do unto others the good that you want them to do unto you. As you ponder the meaning of the Christmas story, my prayer is that your heart would say like Mary, let it happen unto me according to your unusual ways. Three ways to say yes to God this Christmas season. Say yes to God's word. Say yes to God's unusual ways. And finally this, say yes to God's slave wages. Say yes to God's slave wages. Beloved, there is always a cost connected to God's call. God asks us to put something at risk first and then his blessing comes. He asks us to offer to him what's precious to us. He asks us to make personal sacrifices. He sometimes asks us to put everything we have, all of us, our very life on the line and trust him. Going in, Mary understood that and she said yes. Saying yes changed the course of her whole life. She gave up the right to a quiet, peaceful, predictable life. Joseph believed her story because God spoke to him in a dream, but others doubted her character for the rest of her life. As soon as Mary said yes, she only spent six months out of the next several years at home. Saying yes took her on a journey to the suburbs of Jerusalem and then on to Bethlehem where she delivered her baby in a room full of animals and then on to Egypt with a newborn child. Saying yes opened Mary's life to intrusion by all kinds of strangers and exposed her to all sorts of danger. The, sorrowhood of, the sorrow of widowhood awaited Mary and then the sorrow of losing her firstborn son. Saying yes meant that a sword would pierce her soul. When Gabriel told Mary God's plan, her reply was, I am the Lord's servant. You know what the word is in Greek? It's the word doulos. It means a slave. I am the Lord's slave. I belong to him. I do his bidding. Slaves don't earn wages. They expend themselves in service of their master. Mary understood that those who answer God's call to service answer at their own expense. Doulos is the same word that Peter, Paul, and John used to describe themselves, their service to Christ. James, her other son, through her husband Joseph, used that word to describe himself, a doulos of Jesus Christ, serving him for life at great personal cost. What gave Mary the courage to say yes? I want to share three things with you and then we're done. What gave Mary the courage to say yes? Three things. First of all, God's grace surrounded all of her questions and fears. Never noticed it before. Isn't it amazing, the word of God? No matter how many times you read a passage of scripture, when you read it again, God speaks something new. You see something you never saw before. I, I never saw this before. But in verse 29 of Luke 1, it says Mary was deeply troubled. She had questions. She had thoughts. She had concerns. She was pondering. But, but all of her questions, all of her concerns are completely surrounded by God's grace. In verse 28, Gabriel said, 
Hail Mary, rejoice Mary, you have found favor with God, grace with God. And then in 29 are her concerns, her fears, her doubts. But then in verse 30, he says, you are, you found favor with God's sight. See, her, her, her fears, her doubts, her questions, they're in the middle. And all around them is the word of God's grace, 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 grace. And God's just like that with you and with me. We have questions, we have doubts, we have concerns, we don't understand. God, we don't know how things are going to work out. But surrounding us is God's word, grace, 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 favor, favor, favor around you. What gave Mary the courage to say yes? God's grace surrounded her. Second, God's empowering presence was with her. God's married a message uh, God's message to Mary was the Lord is with you. It's the same word that God spoke to Isaac in a season of famine. Stay here, Isaac, and I will be with you. And Isaac sowed seed and reaped a hundredfold harvest. It's the same word God spoke to Jacob, go home and face your brother Esau, Jacob and I will be with you. It's the word God spoke to Moses. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, and I will be with you. God spoke it to Joshua, lead the people into the land, and I will be with you. He spoke it to Gideon, strike down the Midianites, and I will be with you. Mary was no Bible scholar like old Zechariah but she knew enough to know what I will be with you meant. She knew enough to know that it meant things might not be easy, but it's going to turn out on the winning side. That God was up to something much bigger in the world than she could imagine. And that whatever she was lacking for the task at hand, God would surely supply. What gave Mary the courage to say yes? God's grace surrounded her. God's empowering presence was with her. And third and finally, God's revelation was inside of her. Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Those are the same words that Jesus used in Acts 1.8 when he told the disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Gabriel went on, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You know that word overshadow is used in the Old Testament to describe the cloud of God's presence that came down on the tabernacle while Moses was inside praying. And while Moses was praying, that glory cloud came down and God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And God revealed to Moses that another was coming, a Messiah, a prophet like Moses, and that God's people must listen to him or be cut off. That word overshadow is used in the New Testament to describe the cloud that descended on Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And while Peter and James and John were watching, a voice called out from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. We're not told when the moment happened that the cloud of God's presence overshadowed Mary. Perhaps it happened while Gabriel was still speaking to her. We don't know. But what we do know is that same cloud descended on Mary and impregnated her with the Son of God. And she was carrying inside of her a revelation of God. Mary said yes to God's slave wages. She said yes to the cost. She said yes to to the personal sacrifice. She said yes to the utter disruption of her life. And in return, she became blessed among all women on earth. But you know, more important is that she received the blessing of salvation that her son purchased on the cross. During his earthly ministry, someone called out to Jesus, blessed be the mother that gave birth to you and nursed you and Jesus called back and said blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it 
You see, Mary's greatest blessing didn't come from giving birth to the Son of God. Her greatest blessing came from believing on the Son of God. And that's my wish. No, that's my prayer for you this Christmas season. That God's grace would come and surround all your questions, all your worries, all your doubts, all your fears that God's empowering presence would abide with you and supply you with everything you need for the task at hand. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the cloud of his glory will descend on you and give you a revelation of Jesus, an inner witness of him in your heart. Gabriel left with one final word from God. In our old English Bibles, it says nothing is impossible with God. What Luke actually wrote was no word from God will be impossible. If God has said it, he will surely bring it to pass. If he has promised it, he will surely deliver. If God has called you to it, he will surely empower you to get through it. My prayer for you this Christmas is that you would believe and that you would say yes to God. Say yes to his word. Say yes to his unusual ways. Say yes to his slave wages. I am the Lord's servant. Let it all happen to me just as he has said.